Hello, I'm Paul Lambers and welcome to our penultimate episode of Season 1 of CultureScope featured on Cypress Mail's interactive web portal Good Living. Our location for this episode is the peaceful rural resort of Bisuri. Centrally located between Limassol and Bafos, this hillside location is partly cradled by rocky white cliffs that meet the sea, making the entire setting picture perfect. Quaint and intimate, Bisuri village is nestled into the mountain side, alive with familial generations of different backgrounds and cultures. Discovering this unique part of the island is tantamount to putting yourself intimately in touch with Cyprus's unique landscape of wild natural beauty. Verdant olive groves and vineyards, citrus trees and wildly growing flowers, one need not venture far in search of activities and entertainment. Bisuri has a rich religious heritage. Beyond the imposing church of Apostolos Andreas that dominates above the village square are unique artistic chapels employing modern techniques and another with a profound raw appeal that serves as a benchmark for the area. The chapel of Ayos Piridonas is built within a cave at the base of a rocky hill in the Ambelojori area above the Bisuri Gulf. Consecrated in 1999, the church was built by two siblings in memory of their parents who were from the occupied village of Asha. The feast day of the saint is celebrated on the 12th of December. Overlooking the secluded Bisuri Bay, Columbia Beach Resort is an award-winning resort offering luxurious suites designed to surpass international standards of five-star luxury. With its distinctly Cypriot architecture, rejuvenating spa, lagoon-style swimming pools, gourmet restaurants and stunning location, this resort is a timeless treasure. A lively yet supremely elegant resort with superb facilities, the Columbia Beach Resort offers an intoxicating mix of luxury accommodation, opulent spa and fine dining. A firm favourite with visitors and locals alike, this haven of tranquility features a luxury swimming pool at its heart, with the hypnotic sound of the sea adding to the calming atmosphere. Bisuri offers a myriad of experiences, from the cosmopolitan mountainous village to a distinctive landscape, five-star retreats and incredible views, this picture postcard village is second to none with its wealth of culture and awe-inspiring beauty. A little over a year after the last professional tennis match of his career, Marcos Bagdadis is enjoying his life here in Cyprus, aware of the fact that he remains one of the most popular players of the ATP Tour in recent years. Marcus, it's been 17 years since you've turned professional. Looking back, how much did you work on building up your character, both on the court and off it, to become one of the most successful sports figures in Cyprus? It's, a, it's an interesting question, but uh, like everybody in life, I think evolves slowly, slowly, learns from, so, from uh, decisions that he makes and, uh, and just living life itself. And uh, I think as, as a, I learned as a person because Leaving from Cyprus at a very young age, when I was 14, uh, I pretty quickly learned how to take responsibility of, of my life because I was alone. And uh, I mean, it, it helped me tremendously in, in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, I, I decided who I want to be. I decided how I want to be, what kind of person. And uh, I think uh, I evolved as a person in the right side and I'm very happy with that and I'm very grateful that I had that you know, lesson in life at a very young age. Who has been instrumental to your success? My idol was my older brother. He went through a lot in his life. Uh, some, uh, some things happened to him and I learned from that a lot. And for me to see him 
you know, with all these difficulties that he had, get through them, and the way he get through them, you know, it was another lesson in my life at a very young age. And uh, yeah, I, I, he was one of my idols. And then, yeah, moving back into tennis, Agassi inspired me, you know, he was an inspiration for me. And uh, Patrick Rafter, both of them, you know, I, I was the kind of guy that I was not stick to one person. I would see the good of many people and uh, try to learn from each person I liked and I liked to watch and inspired me. My coaches, my teams, all these years also, you know, helped me. All of, all of them, it's not only one person, it's all the team that helped me uh, improve in my tennis, improve as a person. And uh, I cannot just say one, one ab about one person, but uh, the only thing I can say, yes, definitely the decision of my father and mother letting me go at 14 years old, I think it was the toughest decision a parent can take to let their child. And they did it and they did it for my own good. And, uh, you know, that made me who I am today. <laughs> you refer to tennis greats Rafael Nadal, Roger Federer and Novak Djokovic as the big three. How have they created a positive impact on your life? I was playing in the generation of the three of the best tennis players and maybe we will ever have, you know. Uh, I think they're, they're all three and I, I can put Andy Murray in there too, you know, because he didn't win as many Grand Slams, but he won a lot of tournaments and he was in a lot of Grand Slams finals. Uh, I mean, I learned a lot from them, especially from, from Rafa and uh, Andy and Novak. We were similar ages, you know, uh, they're one and two years younger than me. So we, we saw, I saw their development throughout the years. I saw them work when they were young. And, uh, you know, I tried to, to learn from them when we were young and try to you know, as a Cypriot, I didn't have the facilities they had uh, because of, of, you know, English, Spanish, they have some facilities. And, and I tried to look and learn from every, every aspect, you know, and, uh, and they, they teach me a lot, uh, not themselves, but how they worked and everything teach me a lot how to, how to work and how to uh, get that uh, self-discipline in me, which I didn't have as a Cypriot boy, you know, that we don't have here in Cyprus. We can say that too, uh, in all domains, not only in, in, in tennis. In 2019, you took up the new role of coach for Ukrainian Elina Zvitolina, the current world number five. What core values are you trying to instill as a mentor? Keep learning. I think that's the most important thing and I think that's where I'm going to go a bit back, sorry. Uh, that's what maybe I didn't do so well when I got to the finals or when I, when I got up there to number eight in the world. Yes, I had some injuries, but then somehow I stopped learning and I wanted results instead of, you know, taking step at a time and keep on learning. And, and I think, I mean, she has everything. She's five in the world. And I think the secret at that point, when you get to that point is accepting that you need to keep on learning and not stop learning and looking only at the result. And uh, that's what I, I try to teach most of, of the people that I try to mentor is there is, you never stop learning in life. And even me as a coach, I, I mean as a mentor, as a coach, as how you want, I want to keep on learning. And, uh, and I think that's the secret of, of, of success, you know, keep on learning every day, becoming a better person than you were yesterday, and, uh, and just, you know, st take it step by step and be patient. Marcos Bagdatis, the end to a marvelous career. I retired a year ago, I wanted to spend time with my family. As you know, my kids right now are my priority. Uh, I'm trying to do stuff, help, I mean, not help, but work with some kids here in Cyprus, which are the age that need some help and some work with me. Uh, I'm trying to do that and uh, soon I will, I will do something uh, very nice here in Cyprus, like maybe a small academy that will, um, that will uh, make me and my wife also, because my, as you know, my wife Carolina was an ex 
a professional tennis player. She was number 17 in the world and she knows a lot in, in, in this domain too. She's very, very good. And I think um, uh, what we are planning to do is going to work with some kids here in Cyprus and uh, try to raise the level of tennis here in Cyprus. Yoria Deter is the director of the Rialto Theatre, one of the island's best-known theatres and one of Limassol's gems. An actor force in the cultural scene of Cyprus, Yoria was also the director of the artistic programme for the European Capital of Culture, Bafos 2017, putting Bafos in the spotlight of Europe's cultural gaze. Georgia, you've been actively involved in the cultural life of the island for many years. As an artistic director of the Rialto Theatre here in Limassol, what opportunities are you creating to support and promote local talent to the international audience? I think there are two kinds of international audience. The one is the local international audience. Um, Limassol is a multicultural, multinational, international city. And therefore, the international audience is existing also here. We promote, of course, all our programs and all artists, locals and internationals, to this audience um, all the way. And on the other hand, we do have a lot of relations to the international scene, cultural scene. Uh, we invite every year many organizers, many festival programmers to our festivals. We organize six uh, international festivals, as you probably know. And um, we have there the best occasions to promote, to show the talented Cypriot uh, creators and in music, in cinema, in, uh, in theatre, in dance. They are the best options for them to get invited abroad in festivals, some of them very well known internationally. The Rialto Theatre is a landmark in Limassol that has changed the cultural scene not only in Limassol but also across Cyprus. How does the theatre work today? The Rialto has reopened in 1999 but it, um, it has been a historic cinema for many decades. Started uh, working in uh, 1933. It was, of course, in the center of Limassol at that time. The bad times or the, the crisis for the cinema came, of course, in the 70s. The one cinema after the other here in Limassol have been closed down. So Rialto did. And uh, there was, thank God, the momentum that the Rialto was bought by the uh, Cooperative Savings Bank. Uh, they bought the old uh, historic building and they transform it to this modern theatre. And the most important is that they made out of the theatre a foundation, an organisation that is programming, that is uh, managing this theatre in order to offer culture um, at a high standard, but also to make culture accessible to everybody. In 2017, you spearheaded the artistic program for the European Capital of Culture, Bafos 2017. How do you feel knowing that you have actively contributed to a lasting legacy that has influenced and changed the mindset of thousands of people? I'm very glad that you say so. I also believe that uh, Bafos 2017 and the years before 2017, the three, four years before, the preparation years, they have uh, brought a great change into the society of Paphos, not only regarding audience and culture awareness, which have been increased uh, uh, hugely, but also into um, many different um, social dimensions. The inclusion is there more than it was. The, the, the different foreigners' communities, they have come closer together. Of course, they are aware there are also the great world-class events but also this kind of uh, feeling uh, of the Paphos people, the pride for their city, um, this confidence of the artists in Paphos, and of course the big audience which now is there in Paphos and uh, supports culture, supports performances there. I still remember very well the opening of Rialto. And if I could add, of course, the, the opening celebrations with Mikis Theodorakis, with Michalis Kakoyanis, with the presence of these two ecumenical uh, personalities in cultural life, 
These are the most important. Uh, I cannot forget them. Do you believe Cyprus has the potential for culture to be seen as a growth sector? There are so many artists, high-skilled artists here in Cyprus. There's so much talent. The country is so beautiful. There are so many sites. There are the historic places here. Actually, we have all opportunities to be a center of production, either in filming, in theater, in music. We can be a bridge between Mediterranean, Europe, uh, Africa. To somebody who might be interested in culture, I would tell him, stay open, take as much as you can from this culture. It's actually a miracle to have the ability to, to read, to see, to make of perhaps also part of this universe that is called culture. It's, um, it's unbelievable. For me, it's, uh, it's the wealth in your life. It all began in the year 2000 when veteran of international and local rally racing Demi Mavropoulos decided to open the only automobile museum in Cyprus, offering a unique experience to all classic car enthusiasts. Demi, with over 45 years of rallying experience, you hold the best finishing record of any Cypriot driver in the Rothmans International Rally and the overall placing in all the Cyprus championships to date. How did it all begin? When I was 14, I started to drive competitively and within a year, I was in the first three. And then everybody started to say, ah, who is this who has come new? I also had the talent of persuading people to back me up as sponsors. I was the best paid Cyprus driver in my young days. And having done this, I had my foot in the door wherever, when I went to England and Europe, I had already something to show behind me. And that helps a lot. The Cyprus Historic and Classic Motor Museum houses a unique collection of privately owned classic cars of the automobile era that are obviously distinctly individual with wide-ranging appeal. What can one expect when visiting the museum? The museum, it is not only a museum, it is a historic museum as well as being a museum. What does that differentiate from other museums? There are historic cars from historic cars from Cyprus, England, and a little bit around the world, and also some limited edition cars. And uh, now I'm expanding more into the German, American. We are very, very honored to have this car next to us, which is the oldest car in the world, which is a replica made by Mercedes-Benz. It is the first uh, petroleum car or benzene car or uh, and he was the inventor and he went bankrupt and then Daimler bought him and that's why we have Daimler-Benz today. There is nobody as crazy as me to have 214 cars next to us and another 15 cars being waiting to find space to come in. What other programs and services does the museum offer? I created the club. I have about 850 paid members with their classic cars and I do five uh, events, challenge events. It's not a speed events, they are 35 kilometers an hour and we go and visit. We have a, a route with a proper road book, clocks, etc. And there is a first, second, third and there is a championship with these five rallies. The Classic Club looks after charity. Students come here at a very, very low price and uh, they come with their buses. Uh, we 
cater for them by going around and explaining everything. We also have a cinema room, which we give them optically what, how they should cross the road, etc., etc. Always behind my mind was one thing, to leave something behind long term, to Limassol, which I love, and also to Cyprus, so they have something to look at and visit like a museum. Michael Berardi is a renowned trainer, speaker and best-selling author on public speaking, leadership and business culture. Working in over 19 countries, Michael has become a highly respected and in-demand speaker and trainer across the globe. During difficult times, people say, let's find our motivation, let's find our passion. What you need to find is upskilling. We do not trade products or services, we trade reputation. The pain of remaining the same outweighs the pain of changing. Michael, doing a good job is just part of your success. When did you first unearth those innovative secrets that help turn visions into reality? I'll say something that they say in the theater, and I think you know it better than me, you are as good as your last performance. So there is no unearthing. There is hard work, perseverance, resilience in this time and age. And uh, as I said at the beginning, you're as good as your last performance. The person who has seen me in a speech that I wasn't so good, that's what they remember. The person who has seen me in a speech that I excelled, that's what they remember as well. So there are no secrets and there is no time frame. It's continuous work uh, to reach uh, in inverted commas success, which is very elusive and you never reach it. How relevant is personal branding for entrepreneurs? We do not trade products or services, we trade reputation. And personal branding is your reputation. Uh, I have a speech that I've given in Hong Kong uh, three years ago, the five P's of success. I'm not gonna go into all this, but some of the P's are the following, to be positive, to be prompt, to be product-centered. It also applies for service-centered, but I wanted the five P's. So it's all about honoring those promises. It's all about trading your reputation. Most people think they're trading on price. They think they're trading on products. They think they're trading on a camera, on a show. It's reputation. Get your reputation right, the price will fix itself. Everything will fix itself. So that's, for me, it's personal branding. And as the owner of Amazon, Jeff Bezos said, it's what they say about you when you're not in the room. That's what branding is all about. I believe your passion should become your purpose and ultimately your profession. Is it difficult to motivate and inspire people during difficult times so that they too can find their own sense of purpose? When the pain of remaining the same outweighs the pain of changing, you will change. When a relative of mine was smoking for 40 years and she got cancer and she went to the doctor and the doctor told her that she has cancer, she quit smoking. When the pain of remaining the same outweighs the pain of changing, you will change. So whenever we have difficult times, I feel bad, but I also feel great. And that's where you find your purpose. That's what motivation is all about. It's not about great words. It's about finding the pain. Although many people harbor a deep desire to seek change in their lives, they often turn away from opportunities and experiences because the reasons not to do things weigh heavier than reasons to do them. What advice would you give to someone in order to fuel their desire and essentially overcome those barriers? First and foremost, if you need it badly, at the end of the day you'll find a way to do it. And. Um, what, what I do with my mentees, I get them to write down their goals in the present format. Uh, not, I want to quit smoking, I am a non-smoker. Because the, the subconscious mind can help you. So, write things down, but the secret doesn't work on its own. You have to work at it. You can hire a coach, but at the end of the day, the coach cannot do the, your push-ups. I can hire the best coach in the world. They will tell me the exact exercises, how many times per week, per day, per minute. But if I'm not willing to sweat it out, that's money thrown aside. During difficult times, people say, let's find our motivation, let's find our passion. No, no, what you need to find is upskilling. Upskilling, not motivation and passion. I think during difficult times, you find motivation and passion because the pain of remaining the same 
outweighs the pain of changing. It's upskilling that people need. I found my purpose not early in life, but later on in life. I found it at, at 44 years of age, and I found it, which was one of the most important events in my life, when my father died. I wasn't born poor, I uh, wasn't a sad case, I was born in a, an okay family, we were comfortable enough economically, but when my father died, I knew that I had nowhere, no, no, nothing to fall back on. So that was the time, and uh, I'm sorry to say it live, at 44 years of age that I felt that I became a man. When I met Jeffrey Gidomer, the sales consultant uh, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, I saw him on stage, I was mesmerized. I said, I want to become that. And I was just a salesperson in Cyprus, dealing with other family business variety with catering equipment and tabletop supplies. Um, I mean, I didn't have any qualifications. I didn't study anything about training. I said, I want to become that. So I went up to him and I told him, Mr. Gidomer, how can I become like you, sir? And he said, it's easy and it's difficult. And as a Cypriot, I said, what's easy? And he said, study two hours on your chosen topic every day except weekends. In five years, you will be recognized in your country as an authority, 10 years worldwide. And then I said, what's it done? He said, you have to have consistency. Can you stay at it for 10 years straight? Every day except weekends, two hours every day. In other words, he was telling me about the 10,000 hour rule which was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Outliers. It wasn't Ma Malcolm Gladwell's rule, but it was popularized there. And he's right, 10 years correspond to 10,000 hours approximately. I do help people, and I'll give you one example. Um, when I'm doing seminars, I don't even touch my phone. I don't even answer my phone. But there is a gentleman who was working at Polyclinic Gia. He lost his job, and uh, he had also a child to take care of and uh, he couldn't make ends meet. And I was at the University of Lausanne. I was giving a seminar. Uh, very influential people called me. I didn't answer. I will answer after seven hours when I complete the course. And then this gentleman called. And I answered. I never answered in my seminar. But you know why I answered? Because I felt like I was his hope. If I didn't answer the phone when this gentleman was calling, it was like, he had no, no, nowhere else to turn. So helping him wasn't about finding a job, which I found one at the end. It was about uh, giving someone hope about humanity. If, someone, if, if we change a person's life, uh, if we gave meaning to somebody, yeah, I mean, that's the biggest reward of them all. Because honestly, I feel I am 25 years old, whereas I'm 48, going to 49. Time has flown and uh, we were friends many, many years ago. Uh, we met in classroom when I was a young boy. And uh, honestly, when I see people telling me this, not I read your book, not congratulations about your, but you have changed my level, you have helped me. I feel proud and uh, I, have an ob I feel an obligation to try even harder and help people. Olga Balakleets is a multifaceted entrepreneur and a CEO of an international events company. With a distinctive Russian cultural presence in Cyprus, Olga is the creator of numerous cultural and philanthropic projects that have a transformative effect on individuals and communities worldwide. Olga, you are the CEO of an international events company and founder of several annual cultural and philanthropic initiatives worldwide. However, you're also a renowned award-winning concert pianist and soloist. Take us back to the beginning. How did it all start? It started uh, with my piano lessons, which had to be very intensive from the very beginning, having a mother pianist and piano teacher. And obviously me showing a very early uh, talent and ability to perform in front of many people. I was born in the south of Russia and by the age of 10 I moved uh, to the cultural capital, one of two cultural capitals of Russia, St. Petersburg. I continued my studies there and of course performing and after graduating from the school I became an organizer of students' concerts. I was given a special job uh, to organize concerts um, in different factories, 
uh, other universities and I had to select a team of students and put programs together. Not only I was performing but I was organizing and this is how later developed into something else when later I became organizer of uh, established cultural um, events, annual events and various cultural initiatives. The Cyprus Russia Charity Gala is a prestigious event aimed at bridging the cultures of the two countries and highlighting the hospitality of Cyprus. In 2007, the year when uh, I've started the uh, Cyprus Russia Gala, it was shortly after I arrived in Cyprus for the first time and of course I fell in love as many other Russians um, with the warmth of uh, Cypriot people, with our cultures and re religions be being so close. I realized there was an um, absence of such an event, a uh, glamorous event, cultural event, at the same time supporting philanthropic um, course. And because of my experience uh, in other countries and especially in London, I realized that um, it would be good to create something like this in Cyprus and so here we are. Uh, it started in 2007 with the patronage from the President and the First Lady then and all these years carried on and hopefully after we overcome pandemic we will be able to return again to life edition next year going back to the Presidential Palace. Throughout your many years of organizing ambitious events, you've also been passionate about creating inspiring and meaningful experiences for women. In what way has your international platform, Creative Woman, promoted successful female entrepreneurs? I'm uh, delighted to, to admit that this very, very important initiative for myself as a founder and generally, hopefully, for women also started in Cyprus five years ago. And we had four uh, lovely gatherings, live gatherings, conferences uh, in Cyprus, starting in Paphos, and then the last one um, was in Limassol. It's always a pleasure for me to, to bring new initiatives to Cyprus and to do as much as possible on the island. And of course, it, it was so symbolic uh, to do and to start an initiative for women on the island of Aphrodite, probably the, the most inspirational lady uh, associated with, uh, with the country. Teatrum Vitae has been designed to transcend barriers and unite people around the world through a unique synthesis of performing and visual arts. How will this global multifaceted venture create a lasting cultural legacy? Teatrum Vitae as a platform um, and the concept came a uh, few years ago to my partner Rafael Brzezinski with whom we're working very, very closely on developing the platform and all the projects associated with the activities of the platform. The platform is aiming to unite people around the world via culture, cultural events, spiritual events. And the path of Aphrodite, which is the name of the first show, is aiming this as well. We are very, very determined to bring it to life by summer 22 and make it a beautiful and very, very successful show. But of course, the main meaning is to come out with a message of beauty, harmony, unity, as the Atomita platform is aiming exactly for this uniting people together. This is something what, what is so much needed um, right now in the world with so many disturbances. I never became a composer, I never composed uh, my own uh, music. Uh, it was influencing me as an artist, as a performer, as an interpreter, performing music of classical and contemporary composers. But all this enriched me as a person and helped me to, to design beautiful projects, cultural, artistic projects. Uh, late in life, certainly. Hey. This is Catherine and Elizabeth Brown. Relax. You're in paradise. 
you love me, baby? How much do you love me? More than all the money in the world. We have enough now. That's something one man would say. I can't do this forever. One more week. That's it, golden rule. We go see the world. Let's dance! Come on! Come on. What if we get caught? We're never gonna get caught. I own a hot air balloon. Written and directed by Roman Dorinen, the film starts off with a hot air balloon flight that takes a dangerous turn when it becomes untethered and the passengers ascend without a pilot. As they are pushed far out over the ocean, it's a desperate fight for their lives where every choice they make could be the difference in their survival. Produced and filmed exclusively in Cyprus, SOS Survival Sacrifice made its screen debut recently at a closed event at the K Cineplex in Nicosia. SOS Survival Sacrifice is the second major production exclusively filmed in Cyprus under the government's incentive scheme to attract global investment in the audiovisual industry, putting Cyprus on the world cinematic map. Stay connected and follow us on social media. If you want to be featured on Culture Scope, contact our production team on the email provided below. Until next time, stay safe and let culture transform your life.